Well, this is called Paper Lanterns and it's a little section from Chess Pain. My mother used to leave jugs of water on the table on All Souls' Eve so that when the wounded in the other world came visiting they would be comforted by water. And since she died, I often say that she's just beyond my fingertips. I know there is a deficit of rational thinking in both her devotions around All Souls' Night and my way of expressing how close she is to the surface of my memory. But I'm a writer, and I use metaphor all the time. It's the tool of my trade. We shape ourselves and our universe in metaphors. To live without them is, at least for writers, impossible. We are so completely infused with sign and symbol, and our language is so constructed to carry metaphor that it's fair to say, as Rilke did, that the human being is a symbol that reaches perfection in death. It wasn't difficult for me as a child to figure out that water in Ireland was the most powerful symbol of all, a symbol of hope in the face of anxiety, hunger, illness and even death. Holy water stretches beyond the threshold of the invisible world into the shadows where we are all heading. Every county in Ireland is peppered with holy wells, dark pools rising from the rocks below, shaded sanctuaries where spiders thrive, sheltered by old stone walls that keep the wind at bay, and sometimes bushes of rag and bandage or holy medals stand nearby proclaiming cures and blessings received at the well of spring water. In ecological terms, Ireland is a plentiful mother who nurtures humans as well as wild animals and every form of vegetation. The mountains and valleys are full of her name and water is her elixir, its nourishment oozing out from bogs and swamps and mountain streams. The white goddess is a hidden presence everywhere, in lakes, offshore islands, and in the may bushes that flourish from Antrim to Kerry, where the curved hills are known as the breasts of Anu. And when the Christians first set foot on Aaron, with their new fangled images of a masculine god, it was water that their monks sang about. They chanted their prayers of a god who comes like living water to a dry, weary land. On the 23rd of June, 2018, I stood in a field and plucked a tiny yellow flower that had four petals. The smoke of St. John's Eve bonfires was rising from various locations along the slopes of the mountain across the lake. We were moving deeper into summer, and the great Mother Earth was wide awake and singing in her fecundity. I went into my studio and began to pray, to count the knots on a prayer rope to whisper chants of ancient monks who had lived in the deserts of Egypt 1,500 years ago and in Ireland since the 6th century on islands in Fermanagh and Cavan, in the valleys and along the coastline of Donegal and all through the west of Ireland and down as far as the Skellig Rock. This was once an island of monks not unlike those in the deserts of Egypt. They were warriors of interior space, travellers in the psyche, storytellers, bookbinders, iconographers and psychotherapists 
who parsed the destructive force of the psyche into demons and went to battle with them in a crucible of silence. And Europe was imagined out of the foundations that they had left in their wake. But it's difficult to reimagine from the stones of old monastic sites what exactly it might have looked like when the cloisters echoed with Greek chanting, or when the stones were a blaze of colour and iconic narratives decked the sanctuary walls. I have walked among the fallen stones sometimes, scattered through meadows, and seen the ruined huts and prayer halls on islands and lonely places off the western seaboard and although I can't imagine what it was like in Ireland 1,200 years ago, I have been to Electric Picnic and the Body and Soul Festival enough times to know that warriors' shamanistic rituals and the power of myth can still grip young people's imagination. I went to the Festival of the Fires in Ishnock, in Westmead, about ten years ago, which sought to draw young people into a bawdy weekend of drinking, eating and love-making by calling to mind the ancient tradition of honouring May as the month of the fire gods. On the way up the hill on a Friday evening, there was a young man ahead of me wearing sandals and a cloak. He had a fake hatchet and sword strapped to his back. His companion looked like an Apache in a blanket. Three boys from Ratharni were drinking from cans of Druid's cider as a Garda helicopter circled the hill. Four horses passed, their riders cloaked in maroon blankets their faces painted black. At the top of the hill there was a vast saucer-shaped meadow, more than forty acres, which was dotted with wicker huts, wigwams, and sculptures of horses and other creatures made from willow rods. There were stalls selling cider and roasted pig, potato cakes and rashers, there was a vegetarian soup, a bouncy castle, and hundreds of people eating sausages and listening to Sharon Shannon playing her concertina. A motorised glider with blue wings crossed the sky. There was a tent for tattoos, and a cranog on stilts in a pond, and children were running everywhere. Everyone was unwinding, phoning each other, eating bacon, looking for music sessions. There were ribbons on the hawthorn bush in the middle of a club of stones. At 9.30 p.m. the crowd gathered on the highest point of the hill around a pile of wood that reached 30 feet into the sky and the main ritual began. The red sun was just setting as a procession of fire dancers with flaming torches, lanterns and masks came up the slope, fire throwers and drummers leading the way. It was nothing like the tame street parades at arts festivals that I had been familiar with, where children dressed up as exotic fish or dragons from China. This was wild, and it felt both curiously indigenous in a Celtic way and pagan. The darkness deepened, the fire dancers approached the top of the hill. In terms of Greek drama, this was the enactment, enactment of conflict between darkness and light played out before our eyes with all the shamanistic force 
that allowed the observers feel in their hearts the same drama as was happening before their eyes. Impending darkness, the invisible antagonist, haunted the sky and threatened rain and gradually enveloped the earth. But the protagonist was flame, a source of hope. The ordinary folk on the hill were a witnessing chorus, and I felt I was remembering something other than the dull orthodoxy of Christian history. I was reaching back beyond Corpus Christi days, or Lady days, patterns or pilgrimages, or Bilberry Sundays. I was reaching back to recover a more ancient memory from the collective unconscious. I was standing in some wild night fifteen hundred years ago, when fires were lit on the same hill to herald in the summer season and to invoke good fortune, good crops and a good harvest. When the enormous stack of wood ignited, the crowd cheered and the young people found places to sit down, enchanted, in love or just dazed by the magic of the leaping flames. Summer had come. It had been inaugurated by proper ritual. People sat around the fire as if some fragment of eternity had broken through the night for everyone. Teenagers wrapped in blankets gazed at each other, full of desire, as if they had stepped not just into summer, but through a portal to some magical now where they were about to enjoy the time of their lives. I walked back down the path where angels sculpted from paper mache stood in line with outstretched wings. I passed a boy and girl hugging each other at an upturned barrel of flames, their faces lit like something from Caravaggio's dreams. As I got into my jeep at the foot of the hill, I could hear the screech of the illin pipes above, tearing the darkness asunder, and far above me, a paper lantern holding a tiny, flickering flame floated in the night sky. I think what I liked about that moment in my life, being on Ishnock Hill for that particular festival in May, was the ritual of light defeating the darkness. And, of course, in May, going into June, July, August, you were just building up towards midsummer. So it was like a real sense of confidence. It was a, a ritual that was based in where we were at the time of year, based on the, the sun and the earth. And so the ritual could go on on the outside. You had flames, you had this huge fire, you had young people all dressed up as warriors, riding horses, being intimate with each other, longing for each other, touching each other, eating sausages, drinking druid cider, all sorts of the usual chaos you would have at a wonderful festival or a wonderful kind of electric picnic type event. And yet there was within it a coherent ritual. There was a ritual as coherent as it would have been one and a half thousand or two thousand years ago. And that was a ritual of celebrating the light, celebrating May, June, all that time of light and having it like, like in the darkness you light a fire and then the fire keeps going until dawn and it's like, oh look, the, the light has won. But that ritual was going on on the inside because that's the power of ritual. We do it on the outside so it goes on on the inside as well. And it, it tunes and conditions people for the summer and for the joy that was that was there for them, and then for the hard work and for the harvest.
And for me it was remarkable to see that here it was still happening. Still happening in, in you know, 28, well it was 2018, it was 10 years earlier, I suppose it was 20, 2008, 2008. I was at that festival and it was still happening and I hope it happens again. There'd be a few minor issues that need to sort out and that would be to ensure that the fire is not is carbon neutral, you know, that, that they're, they're not actually just wantonly burning stuff and creating a big fire. I think there's ways around that, but the ritual of it as a fire festival is so, so ancient in Ireland and it's so real. It's such an example how young people can enjoy something like a festival on the outside, but there's something going on on the inside as well. There always is, you know. We, we're always living both on the inside and the outside. The only difference with prayer is that we start, or with meditation, is we, st we start to take control of what's on the inside. We start to actually shape it on the inside initially, and in some sense then that shape flows out into what we do on the outside. And that's what I'm talking about this weekend I'm talking about the equinox I'm talking about how we've now turned around now we're fra we're going towards the rituals of winter and darkness and rather than dreading them r rather than sort of dreading winter there's a way that we can embrace it there's a way that we can I'll give you one example uh last night I lit a candle, a small night light in front of an icon. Now, it was about nine o'clock, but it was already dark, and I didn't put on a light in the room, and I just lit that. And it gave me the fire, I have an electric fire that looks like flames. It's just electric, but that was on as well. And so the room began to look very attractive like like it, it it began to feel wintry in a Christmassy way there's, there's no need now I'm not talking about Christmas but but the journey towards Christmas does begin now rather than dreading it there is this way if you can find a ritual for the equinox find a ritual this weekend do something that in some sense says we're going into the dark half of the year and I will embrace it I won't be afraid of it I'll open my heart to the dark the darkness is is simply what we don't know you know the darkness is just what we don't know in in John of the Cross he talks about the dark night of the soul the soul enters into this note oscura the, the night where things are obscure where you cannot see the way forward so that that's a that's a real condition for all of us in life you know that we can't see the way forward i mean i can't see the next five months never mind five years about me life at a rational level i, d I don't know where life is going i don't know what will happen what will arise we all get things that arise up in our families in our health that affect us we don't know what's coming so we're living in a kind of a darkness anyway all the time. And if we take the seasons of the year and ritualize them privately, alone, terribly small things. You know, every time you take a flower into the house and put it in a vase, you have enacted an enormous ritual. I think that the rituals that were collective maybe a thousand years ago have become internalized. That, that maybe the way that in the West, to some extent, you see religious practice withering. But it may be that it's just gone inside and that we do much more internal stuff than we used to. And we do more individual rituals people do all sorts of individual rituals do you do rituals i'm sure you do you know you 
feeding the birds as a ritual. You can feed the birds in a mechanical way. You can feed the birds in a logical, rational way. Say, well, you know, the birds need food. But then you might find out, well, the birds, maybe they don't need food. And then you stop feeding them. But there's a beautiful thing about feeding birds. And there's a beautiful thing when the birds come into the garden for the winter. But you're feeding them, I think, because it's a ritual of generosity. It's a ritual of gratitude. It's a ritual of, of connection with with the life of being that transcends just human life. Again, I suppose one of the great things about ritual, one of the powerful things about ritual is that you can never actually limit what it is to a meaning. The ritual is its own meaning. So, so if I have a particular ritual where I go to a river and I sit at the river and I take a few stones and I throw them into the river. And let's say that's something I've always done at a particular place in a particular river in Cavan whenever I go to Cavan. It's just, what am I doing? It's a ritual. I don't know what I'm doing. There's no answer to it. It, it is its own meaning. One of the things that kills ritual is actually where you, you invest too much meaning in it. You know, some of the things that kill ritual in religion is, is bad ritual where th they've put too much meaning into it. Do you know the wedding? Do you know the wedding moment where the light, the the couple lights two separate candles and then from the two separate candles they light a single candle that's a beautiful ritual but sometimes the priest celebrant whoever is is there will explain it beforehand and they'll say and now john and mary are going to light two candles and this symbolizes their faith and then later in the eucharist they will light a single candle from these two, which represents their union in this marriage. <coughs> and you're going to sleep because, you know, you're explaining something and then doing the ritual actually to illustrate an idea. Now, that's not really what ritual is supposed to be doing. Ritual is supposed to be bringing you to a place beyond ideas. A place that transcends any kind of rational idea and yet it's a it's something a ritual is something that contains a meaning within itself you know there's a meaning in it i mean the, i remember there was a great story do you remember the windows of wonder it was a story by i think brian mcmahon i think it was by brian mcmahon who's in the exploring english book for secondary schools in ireland many 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 years ago and at the end of it there was there was a a teacher, a woman who was lost her job because she was really too dangerous to the closed society of the valley. She was opening windows of wonder for the young children, reading them fantastically wonderful stories, opening their imaginations, and, and she lost her job and she's going out. But there's one strange eccentric character, and as she's going out the gap over the, the hill, uh, pushing her bicycle walking she meets him and he has a few words with her he doesn't talk explicitly about the fact that she's lost her job and going but he said i have a gift for you and he opened his hands and there were two butterflies in the palm of the hand and as he opened the hands the two butterflies flew up into the air and circled each other What did that mean? In one sense, it's emotionally coherent. It's aesthetically coherent. Our hearts know exactly, yes, this is true. It crowns the story because it's the most beautiful thing. But why? Is there some rational reason to explain it? No, not really. 
Not really. It's just a gesture. It's just a gesture without without any meaning beyond its gesture. And and it, when you get into that language, you've got into the language of sort of an emotional intelligence that expresses itself in the body. Th- that's a fantastic place to get to. Where your body is able to communicate with people around you by gesture, by its physicality. And that you make you make yourself move through the air in various gestures. It could be it could be something like lighting a candle, it could be the way you present a plate on the table, it could be a flower. A flower that you hand to somebody. No words. Silence. Just flower in hand, hand reaching out to other person, like, not even saying take this, just present it. That's a beautiful moment. That's when the body is, is tuned into an emotional intelligence and begins to, to dance really with the cosmos with the world around. And ritual is simply the formalization of that. Ritual is simply the formalization, the formalization of that emotional intelligence that collectively says, you know, we'll do this, we'll do it this way, we'll we'll have a, let's say, an icon and we'll carry it aloft and we'll have incense and we'll have people singing and we'll all go in a big procession and we'll go round in a circle, round the church in a circle. That's a ritual. There was a lovely ritual to have. I saw it in in, in a monastery one time in Minsk um, where the, the monks, the sisters, at the end of the day, they do it, they go around the, the outside of the church with this icon and candles and, and all the f- regalia. And it's a lovely procession. And then they come back into the church and th- that's the end of the night. But nine o'clock at night they do this. And this is going to be the end of their day, the end, the end of the day for them. And so the way they break up is that they make two kind of semicircles, and then each person goes round each person in the other semicircle to shake hands and to bow. And it carries something of reconciliation and forgiveness for anything that happened during the day. Just, it's just they shake hands in a very formal way and then bow. And when the whole ritual is finished, every single person has connected to every single other person in that way. It's a ritual. And that's how they end the day. They don't have to invest emotion in it or they don't have to have a particular thought like, oh yes, I, I annoyed you today, I'm very sorry or something. But the ritual is like the whole collective community breathing. And they are breathing this moment of forgiveness. And that's a, a really good way to to end the day. It says somewhere, I think it's in St. Paul, don't let the anger, no, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Never carry your anger across the threshold into the night you know try and shake it off try and have some ritual at the end of the day that shakes off every 
negative experience of the day. Shake it off. And that's a good way to go into the winter as well. Going into the dark. So, thank you for being here. And forgive me, I'm sorry, I went a bit too long. But it's a real pleasure to be with you. And I'm really, really absorbed by that whole idea of Ritual, forgiveness, don't bring any anger into the dark, don't bring any anger into the night time, but when you do go into the night, when you do go into the winter, don't go there with dread, don't go there worrying about it, no matter what the worries are, no matter what will come up, they're the unknowns, that is the darkness, but in some way, go in there with a sense of of trust and surrender that there will be a light in here for you. There will be some really wonderful light in this darkness for you. And that's the way I think about it as I go from here to midwinter. I will embrace this darkness. I will go deep into this darkness. I will be the light and find the light in this darkness. I will embody the light in this darkness. And embodying the light, I will create my own small private rituals to celebrate the light in this darkness. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye.